Ray Farris and chair of the Thomas Willis Lambeth Lecture Committee on Public Policy. On behalf of the committee, I welcome you to the ninth annual Lambeth Lecture. The lecture was funded nine years ago autonomously to honor Tom Lambeth, a visionary leader for North Carolina. Tom served as an aide to Governor Terry Sanford and to Congressman Richardson Pryor in the 1960s, and then for more than two decades as executive director of the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. Once described as North Carolina's do-gooder in chief, Tom is widely admired for his personal integrity, his passionate devotion to education, democracy, and civic engagement, and his wholehearted pursuit of the ideals of the public good. He is here today, and I am delighted to recognize him and his wife, Donna. Would you please stand? I should have said, and will say now, Donna is his, in all ways, sustaining partner. Uh, I recognize, uh, we, we want to recognize uh, several guests who are with us. Former Chancellor James Meeser. Chancellor Meeser, we're delighted to have you. And former Senator from Tennessee and Ambassador to China, James Sasser, and his wife, Mary. <laughs> the purpose of the Lambeth Lecture is to bring to the campus leaders and scholars of public policy, particularly individuals whose contributions impact democratic institutions, civic engagement, education, and ethics. Today, we are pleased to offer two such persons. Alex Kaczynski, judge and former chief judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and University of North Carolina President Emeritus Tom Ross, a former judge himself, in a con conversation on the timely and important subject of criminal justice reform. Chancellor Folk was unable to attend tonight's meeting. She is out of town. In her place, I invite Professor Dan Gitterman, Chair of the Department of Public Policy, and its Thomas Willis Lambeth Distinguished Professor to welcome you on behalf of the campus and the department. Following his remarks, Judith Wagner, Burton Craig Professor of Law, and Dean Emerita, of the law school who will introduce our speakers. Professor Gitterman. Thank you, Ray, and thank you for all your leadership of the Lambeth Committee and also to all the members of the Lambeth Committee who make up the front row for your collaboration and friendship. And on behalf of my UNC public policy colleagues who make up most of the second uh, and third rows, we also extend uh, a heartfelt welcome to the ninth annual Distinguished Lambeth Lecture. Welcome to Carolina, Judge K. There is a Coach K <laughs> at a university that we would not welcome here. But you, Judge K, are welcome and welcome to Carolina. President and Mrs. Ross, welcome home. The, kitty, the committee asked me to do two things. One, extend a welcome on behalf of Chancellor Folt, Provost Dean, and Dean of the College, Kevin Guskowitz. Just to note, that means I was the fourth choice to offer a welcome. <laughs> Number two was keep your remarks under one minute. So welcome, thank you, and good night.
Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'd add my welcome to those already expressed. It's my privilege to introduce to you our two speakers this afternoon. Uh, you may know, those of you who've come to prior lectures, that the format today is slightly different. Uh, we have presented the topic as a conversation about criminal justice reform with the understanding that we need more, con conservation, more conversations about this topic in the country and certainly in our state given recent developments here. Uh, I would say to add to Ray's comments that the committee always thinks very hard about what an important current topic is. We value very much the students on the committee and we really, I think, are guided by what we think are important issues to present to the students because they're, after all, why we're here. The uh, first of our discussants today is President Emeritus Tom Ross. I think many of you know him and admire him. Uh, he's my candidate for recognition and profiles and courage for the current era. Uh, he is currently up in New York City as the president of the Volcker uh, Alliance. He was, as you know, president of the university system that is all 17 of our campuses in one of the hardest times in recent memory uh, because of major changes in the public wheel, the higher education universe, and many other things. He is someone who's a man for all seasons. He continues to have an affiliation with Duke Sanford School of Policy and our School of Government here. Indeed, he's been working actively on new strategies for legislative redistricting. He was previously uh, president of Davidson College, and I always say uh, Stephen Curry took uh, lessons from him at the time. Uh, he, uh, prior to that, had been longtime uh, executive director of the, I was going to say the Lambeth Foundation, the Z. Smith Reynolds <laughs> Foundation. And uh, before that, he was the very highly regarded judge as well as uh, the director of the administrative office of the court. So you can see he has much to bring himself to this conversation. He particularly was involved in sentencing reform, a topic I hope our discussants may touch on again today and received a, a recognition from the Kennedy School of Government for the good work he did in that regard. He is uh, prepared to be the moderator and discussion leader, and I hope he's going to chip in with his own thoughts. He is now officially a friend of the other famous K, the one in the room, uh, Judge Kaczynski. Uh, I've known Judge, Judge Kaczynski since we were in law school together at UCLA and admired him very, very much at the time. He taught me a great deal about how to write for law reviews. Uh, we had classes together. He was known then as someone absolutely brilliant. When he graduated, he went on to clerk for uh, Justice Kennedy, who was then on the Ninth Circuit and later now is one of the most significant voices on the Supreme Court. He also clerked for uh, the Chief Justice at that time. So he's really seen uh, a great deal in his youthful years, but he uh, probably more notoriously, if I can say so, uh, next to William Howard Taft is the youngest uh, federal court appointment ever. So. He was recognized for his brilliance very early. He has uh, written widely on topics uh, from the First Amendment, something that's very important in his earliest writing on the court. Uh, he's also written a lot of very funny and engaging uh, intellectual property decisions that are well worth your uh, review if you're not familiar with litigation about Barbie doll or uh, about Vanna White and the Samsung robot. Uh, he's behind all those secrets, so check him out on Wikipedia later. Um, the format today, though, is going to be that he, who has written a very significant article in the last few years for Georgetown Law Review on criminal justice reform, he will be the main propounder discussant here. Tom Ross will be bringing Alex's thoughts out. Halfway through our time together, you may notice that you have index cards on your chairs. We hope to have collected some of your own thoughts or questions and comments, and we will put those before our uh, dynamic duo here and let them uh, try to bring out the conversation from those of you in the room, because as you know, this is a conversation one we really need to have. So uh, I'd like to invite our honored guests up on the podium, and I would ask all of you uh, to please be aware we'll have students collecting the cards. Uh, if you're in our overflow room in Carroll Hall, we'll be collecting them there as well. Thank you.
Judith, uh, it, it is truly a pleasure and an honor for me to be uh, on this campus and to be uh, back uh, among friends at the University of North Carolina. Uh, it is also a privilege to be with Judge Kaczynski and to have the opportunity to talk with you all tonight uh, about, I think, a, a number of very important issues. Um, you know, we will try to touch on issues of race in the criminal justice system. We will try to touch on issues of uh, excessive incarceration, uh, evidentiary issues and problems that arise, including forensic, uh, uh, long, long held beliefs that certain kinds of forensic evidence was uh, not only admissible, but uh, science at its best, when now we know perhaps that that's not the case. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. Uh, we hope that as the evening goes along that you, it will stimulate uh, questions uh, among many of you, particularly the students. So we're glad you're here and we hope that you uh, will bring to us the questions that are on your mind because I know you have uh, lots to offer in this area and we'd love to hear from you as the evening goes along. Um, it is really an honor to be with Judge Kaczynski who uh, is one of the most respected members of the federal judiciary uh, in our nation, uh, long serving on the Ninth Circuit um, and uh, has been been a federal judge, I think, since 1984 and, and been on the Ninth Circuit since uh, 1985, uh, one of the longest serving, as I said, circuit judges in the country. Um, so he has extensive experience in many different areas, having uh, sat on panels that reviewed cases of all types. Uh, so he brings extensive wisdom to us. Most recently, he was on a, a part of a, a White House panel that reviewed uh, a number of different kinds of forensic evidence, and I'm going to be talking with him about that uh, as we proceed. But first, Judge, I, I would turn to you and, and ask you if you would to uh, tell us a little about your time as uh, a Ninth Circuit judge, particularly as it relates to criminal cases you've reviewed over the years and, and how that stimulated your interest in uh, criminal justice reform. Well, thank you, Tom. It's, uh, it's really an honor to be here, and uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, the faculty and the students for the really warm reception I've gotten. I, I've, uh, I'm really touched. Um, I, uh, I, as you said, I've been a judge for since 82, actually, uh, in the Ninth Circuit for 31 years, and I do a variety of cases. Uh, criminal law is part of my jurisdiction, and part of what we do is uh, hear criminal appeals, uh, in, uh, in federal cases, but we also hear state cases. We, we get uh, death penalty cases from uh, uh, and other um, serious uh, crimes uh, by way of habeas from, from the state courts of the Ninth Circuit. Ninth Circuit are the, is the western part of the United States. It's the biggest thing out there. It's, uh, uh, it uh, covers an area the size of India. We have 60 million people, uh, and uh, a lot of issues arise. Um, so I'm not really a criminal law specialist as such. It's one among the many things I do. And, but with time, I've accumulated a fair amount of experience. And I guess um, over the years, rather than having my um, faith in the criminal justice system strengthened, uh, it has uh, eroded because various issues have arisen that have troubled me. Uh, that I see in case after case after case. And um, I guess I didn't really know I, uh, there was percolating in the back of my mind. I hadn't thought about them uh, systemically. But about a year ago, I was asked to do a, um, a law review article, a foreword to a, um, uh, the criminal law issue of a, the Georgetown Law Review. And I said, well, you know, I'll just throw together a few pages. I can speak on anything. Uh, you know, a sort of a fluff piece. Uh, but when I sat down to write about it, I realized I had uh, serious doubts and serious thoughts about it, and I wound up writing like 50 or 60 pages uh, without, um, pretty much with, um, just living on bread and water near, near my keyboard. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, uh, and these are serious doubts we have in our country, uh, and I think this is something that most people and even most lawyers and most judges are not aware of, but we have the largest prison population uh, in the world. 
Um, we have far more prisoners than any other country. We have more prisoners than China. China is 1.6 billion people, has fewer people behind bars than the United States with some 300 million some people. We have one, uh, 23 um, uh, percent, uh, essentially one out of four of people in prison is in prison or jail in the United States. Um, when you compare us to countries, first world countries, you know, kind of countries that we think we are like, Canada, England, uh, Germany, France, uh, our rate of incarceration and the num amount of time people spend behind bars in the United States is vastly longer. Um, so it is a bargain we have struck, uh, um, and I think we have the impression that uh, by doing this, we have a safer society than, than, than others. But it turns out that's not the case. We, we have less crime now than we did 20 years ago. Crime has been dropping. But that has also been true in other Western countries. In fact, it's been true in much of the, uh, uh, much of the world, particularly the first world. And it has been um, uh, uh, also the case that, uh, um, I mean, if you measure it by any measure, we are not, it does not appear to me that we are safer or better off uh, than, um, uh, than other countries. Um, it is a system that's quite expensive, which is something that taxpayers should worry about. Uh, but it is even more expensive in, in, in terms of human suffering and the human loss. If you take somebody who's committed a crime and is convicted and you have a sentence of five or six years, they may well return to their family, their community, and if they made a mistake, go back to their life. If you put somebody in prison for 20 years or 30 years, you don't get them back. Uh, whatever happens to the family, whatever ties they had are broken. Uh, the children, uh, if there are children, grow up as orphans, essentially. Uh, and so it's a, it's a tragedy that's repeated again and again. Um, you know, that's a policy judgment we make, uh, and we say, well, if these people are in fact guilty, then um, uh, maybe that's justified. Um, unfortunately, over the years, I've come across many cases, uh, more cases than I um, thought was likely, uh, where people have been innocent and have been proven to be innocent uh, years later and been released after 15, 20, 30, sometimes more years in prison. And, and that is very troubling because we as Americans pride ourselves of being the home of the brave and the land of the free. We pride ourselves on having a criminal justice system that um, bends over backwards to give every break to the defendant, uh, to the accused in a criminal case, the presumption of innocence, the burden of proof is on the prosecutor. A jury has to be unanimous in convicting. And I think we have the impression, and I must say I had that impression when I went to law school and for many years as a judge, that all of these layers of protection provide great assurance that if we're putting away people for a very long time, at least they're the right people. We're not putting away people who are innocent. Well, I must say, in the last few years, my, my confidence in that, uh, in that system has been shaken. And I fear uh, that, in fact, uh, there's a great deal of uh, uh, injustice in our system. And that we are putting people away for a long time, but more often than we care to admit uh, to ourselves, uh, we're putting away the wrong people. And I've seen too many cases of injustice of people released years later uh, after having spent the, their best years behind bars. Uh, this was making me uncomfortable. I think this is something that ought to concern all of us. Uh, it is not something you say, well, those are the criminals or the people, you know, uh, we shouldn't worry about them. Of course, they are human beings. They are our brothers and sisters, so we should worry about them regardless. But in many ways, it could be any of us. It could be any of us. And um, when there is a, uh, when there is a, um, a, um, a conviction of a wrong, uh, uh, of somebody who's, uh, the wrongful conviction, somebody who's innocent, there's a second injustice that goes on. And that is that the true perpetrator 
is then left in the community and can and does commit other crimes. So if we were more careful, if the police were more careful, we were, uh, if we were not so quick to jump at trying to prosecute the first person that the, the police uh, or the prosecutor believe is, is guilty, if we took more time, sometimes you would find that you've got the wrong person and that you then save lives and save um, uh, misery by finding the right person to incarcerate. Um, I'm not sure of the crisis point, but I do think we're at the point where if we're a fair society, if we're a just society, if we're kind of, the kind of society that we think we are, we ought to take another look. We need to reconsider. Thank you. So th that raises um, more issues than we could talk about in an hour and a half, I'll tell you. Um, and, I, and I'm almost stumbling in my, around in my head trying to think, well, where should we start? And I guess w one of the things I want to be sure that uh, our students and our audience remember uh, is um, first the difference between state and federal courts. Uh, you know, we have two, two really uh, parallel court systems in the United States, and a lot of criminal court uh, cases are handled in the state courts, but there are um, federal criminal laws as well, and so they find their way to the federal courts. There's a difference between a trial court and a, an appellate court, as you all know. Um, judge Kaczynski is an appellate judge. I spent 17 years as a trial judge at the state level um, and tried an enormous number of criminal cases. And I think w one of the questions that we ought to ask is, why do we incarcerate people? Uh, what are the reasons that we give? And historically, it, at least when I was in law school, they taught us there were really four reasons why we sent people to prison. One was deterrence. Uh, one was uh, rehabilitation. Uh, one was restraint, that is to keep them away and keep us safe. And the fourth, which wasn't, wasn't uh, a, a, a valid reason we were taught, was retribution as a society. Uh, and I'd be interested, Judge, in, in your comments about what, what of those four justifications you think really have value in, our, uh, in terms of punishment, uh, sending people to prison, uh, and what is driving the length of incarceration that we have in this country versus so many other countries that uh, the, the maximum sentences they give are... are, are much, much smaller than, than ours. So what do you think is, uh, what, are the, what of those four theories works for you as a real reason to punish uh, through incarceration? And um, what is driving our, our long sentences in the United States? You know, I think all four are legitimate reasons if they are put in perspective and they're not used as an exclusive reason or, or um, they don't have an overly great uh, influence. For example, take a retribution. I realize it's controversial and it's thought to be uh, um, uh, unchristian or uh, uncivilized to want to have retribution. But, you know, retribution is a, is a genuine instinct. I think we have, there is an aspect of retribution that speaks to justice, the idea that if you've done wrong, you ought to be punished for the wrong, and there is, there is, a, there is a sense of justice that comes with it. And I think that's perfectly fine, uh, so long as we recognize it and we put it in perspective, we don't spend too much, uh, if, if we don't give it over amount of weight. I think what happens in our system is um, that for historical and cultural reason, we are a retributive society. Uh, we're talking this morning about what uh, you were telling me about what happens in Europe, uh, where um, for some minor crime or even some severe crimes, you know, they'll give somebody five, six, seven years in prison, and that's the most. And uh, very often, some people who commit violent crimes may not commit them again because it's a situation uh, um, uh, where uh, it's unique in their lives, uh, and they're not particularly a danger. Uh, I think. Um, in the United States, uh, a very sort of what we consider to be a light sentence for a violent crime, we view this as being not enough. Not regardless of retribution, regardless of capacitation, it just wouldn't seem just. And I think that's something that we need to readjust. We need to, re to be taught and we need to rethink and we need to uh, um, appreciate the fact that a greater sentence doesn't give us more safety. 
uh, a greater sentence is more likely to cause, inflict serious harm on other people, and that is the family uh, of the perpetrator. Uh, and that a greater sentence, a long, longer sentence, exposes us to incredible costs. I mean, killing prisoners in, in, uh, uh, behind bars is a, uh, I keep getting back to this, but this is not a trivial cost. It is, it is a significant cost. It costs uh, 30, 35, 40,000 um, uh, um, dollars a year to keep one prisoner behind bars. It'd be cheaper to put them in the hospital. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, a hospital bed is cheaper uh, than a prison bed. It, it is, uh, but, but you know, the, the university is even cheaper than that. <laughs> <laughs> Send them to college. <laughs> um, uh, and of course, as prisoners have longer sentences and they get older, the cost skyrockets because they become uh, geriatric and they have all the illnesses that everybody else, all of us have, as we get older. And uh, as we know, it doesn't get cheaper uh, to, to uh, you know, they get all sorts of ailments that we need, we have to take care of them because they are awards. At the same time, um, studies have shown uh, that the risk from recidivism or the risk that um, um, pre, um, uh, people who have committed uh, violent crimes will, will uh, uh, will keep being violent, uh, goes down with age. Uh, after about age 40, it becomes uh, fairly low. Now, it's not a 100% risk. You're going to have a Willie Horton kind of situation once in a while, but just as a matter of uh, you know, looking at the whole spectrum of prisons that we have, you could easily let out everybody over 40 of all of our prisons at great savings to us and you know, great relief to them and their families, and you would not have an uptick in crime, is my, is my, my prediction. It, 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 that that we, we are not getting in capacity, you know, really not getting a return on those other values, uh, uh, deterrence, uh, incapacitation, uh, those values are not being served after a certain age and after a certain number of years, which are not in the double digits. Um, so we are paying money, we're inflicting pain, we are, you know, as a society, we are becoming a society of prisoners, you know, where, where that's a major, you know, it should be some, have some effect on our self-image that we have essentially a, such a large prison population, and I don't think we're getting much in return. I think we're getting probably diminishing or maybe negative returns. I remember when we were doing our sentencing reform work in North Carolina, we had some experts come in from around the world, and, and uh, it was fascinating to learn that if there's a lot of studies that, that show uh, someone who's incarcerated more than about six years, that's about the break point, um, the chances of, of rehabilitation and reintegration to society drop significantly after incarceration for a longer period of time. It's as if they, uh, they lose their soul. Uh, after a certain period of time and, and lose hope. Um, and uh, so that's why I think in a lot of countries they've kept the, the length of sentences far lower than we have in the United States. And the judge is right. I, I think if you look at almost any distribution of crime, uh, what you see is crime begins at, at a pretty young age, actually, 13, 14 years old, and shoots up very high among 18 to 20 year olds and then drops pretty precipitously uh, as you get older and by the time you're in your late 30s or 40s uh, there's very little crime committed uh, and those that do commit it it's usually pretty violent and they're often repeat offenders but there are not many of them and so looking for ways to identify those that are likely to be repeat offenders that are likely to be at the biggest risk to, to our public safety I think is a real key to making a criminal justice system uh, that, that is, uh, w works better in terms of taxpayer dollars and how you spend your money. Uh, because it, it is hugely expensive to incarcerate period people for long periods of time. Uh, and uh, as the judge points out, there, there is in this state and many, many prisons around the country now uh, a grave 
of our prisons, uh, which uh, is driving cost up even more. So uh, it is a very significant issue. Uh, and um, there are people that, when they look at that crime curve, there are people who say, well, we should just lock up everybody that's 18 to 22 and we'll be fine. You know, they'll get over it, right? So uh, maybe that's not the best idea. But I do think some focus on what is actually happening, using data to solve problems can be effective. So what, what, what do you think about a compulsory draft? About compulsory, compulsory draft. Well, I've said for a long time, you, I don't you, know if you, it should you, be. Universal uh, no. service. Yeah, service, I, I think yeah. universal service has tremendous advantages for us uh, because it does take our highest risk population uh, and <laughs> provides a, um, you know, some mandatory commitment to the country, either through military service or other kinds of service. And, uh, I think could be a, a real benefit to us in a lot of ways, but one of the side benefits probably would be uh, fewer people committing crimes and in, in that age group. So something we should should perhaps consider. We should think about it. Um, Israel has universal service, uh, even those who, um, for religious reasons, can participate do serve, and um, and of course applies to men and women uh, equally and. Uh, and uh, they have a cohesion that is, uh, they come out of the service and these are lifelong relationships and there's a certain commitment to society and your core of people you serve with that is, you know, missing uh, elsewhere. All right, so I want to turn us a little bit to um, some, some of the issues that you mentioned of unfairness in the system. Uh, and before one of those is the, the panel that you served on, the advisory group you, you served on with the White House that focused on various kinds of, uh, of evidence. Uh, and as you pointed out in our breakfast conversation this morning, um, and as you also, I think, pointed out in, your, in the Wall Street Journal recently, uh, th those of us who watch CIS and all these shows on television, CSI, I guess it is, uh, I don't watch it much, there you go, but you know, it causes us to, it causes us to believe that, that science solves crime and that it's absolutely, uh, you know, the best evidence you can have and you shouldn't question it. Um, and Judge, I'd like to hear about what you learned serving as on the advisory panel of the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology as they looked at this evidence, these kinds of evidence, um, and what you think maybe we should do to address this. Well, the study came out about a week ago. Um, I had seen an advanced copy. It's, it's called PCAS, President uh, Commission on Science and Technology. I'm not quite sure what the initials stand for, but uh, it's uh, issued by the White House. It's by the President's Science Advisor. And um, I was called in along with a number of other judges, colleagues of mine who, who have reviewed the report. And, um, and others, not just judges, there were law professors and, uh, and others who are senior advisors. And um, it was, it's very thorough. Uh, it is incredibly well documented. Uh, it takes sort of a hard look at seven or eight methods of uh, forensic science that have been used in, the, in uh, criminal trials. And it concludes that some are pretty good and that some are just complete bunk. Um, for example, bite marks, and there are people now in prison who are put away because of a claim that the victim had a bite mark that matched the defendant's teeth. Just pure nonsense. There's no science there. Uh, when you actually have a test uh, you know, with you know the result and uh, there's a blind test, they can't tell the difference between human bite marks and dogs' bite marks. They can't sometimes tell the difference between human bite marks and a, um, uh, a flea bite that somehow lined up and looked like teeth. It, it is really uh, um, hair analysis. For years and years and years, people were put away based on comparison of hair follicles. Uh, now, I make it clear, there's also DNA hair testing. That's very different. I'm talking about comparison of hair, which happened before there was DNA testing. Many people were sent to prison based on testimony by FBI um, experts, so-called experts, saying these are the same. 
It turns out they can't tell the difference between uh, kinds of human hair. They sometimes can't tell the difference between dog's hair and uh, human hair. Uh, it is that bad. Um, other kinds of science uh, um, uh, is good, like um, uh, DNA testing when there's a single source uh, is pretty good. It is actually very reliable. Uh, multiple source, like when you have mixed blood or mixed semen and, uh, or mixed uh, hair follicles, th that becomes more difficult. That's, that's more questionable. But if you have single source DNA and it's performed by somebody who is competent and who is careful to keep, avoid contamination and keep, do the test properly, is highly reliable. But the if part of it is not trivial. Uh, there have been many reports since DNA came into, uh, uh, into use of labs where contamination has taken place, uh, where there was carelessness, even falsification. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the recommendations of the report is uh, forensic science is, should be no different from any other science. It should be science, it should be a scientific proof, and therefore you ought to have protocols and procedures that scientists follow. It should be treated like a scientific experiment. Are two things the same? You remember when you took chemistry in college? They gave you an unknown sample and a known sample. You're supposed to compare them and, and, um, and, and draw conclusions. They, they didn't tell you the answer ahead of time. So uh, one of the recommend, among the recommendations is the forensic scientist ought not to be told what the police suspect. They ought to be given the evidence and they are supposed to perform it blind because that's how science is done, blind. And we have reasons for that. Um, science, uh, forensic officers ought to be independent of prosecutors. They ought not to have their funding or their existence or promotion and so on decided upon by the people who have a stake in the controversy. Um, um, there are other such recommendations which I think are entirely common sense and I think would, should be followed. Um, uh, I was disappointed to see that the Attorney General of the United States uh, dismissed the report and said we will not be following those recommendations. And I, I think the, the point you make about evidence is an important one and, and uh, the forensic evidence like fingerprints and hair follicles that, you know, I've tried many cases in which that really was the evidence that, that because it was accepted as uh, such, with such certainty. Um, that is what oftentimes would lead juries to conviction. Another area that I think is important for us to uh, keep in mind is eyewitness identification testimony, which, um, you know, we relied on in the courts for many, many years and still do, but I think there's much more skepticism now about that than there once was. Um, I, I, I would, I'm not going to make her stand up or call her out, uh, but there's somebody in the audience tonight uh, who was the victim of uh, a terrible rape. Um, and in the process of the, of the criminal justice system, um, was asked to do an eyewitness identification. Um, and it later proved with DNA, some many years later, I think 18, um, that it was, she picked out the wrong person. Um, and that person has now been freed, exonerated, um, and she became a champion for doing it the right way. And so in North Carolina, we now require double blind testing uh, and that the officer involved in supervising it can't be involved in the investigation. So there are protections that have been put in place for eyewitness testimony that can make a real difference. And I think that's the same thing this report is suggesting, is that there, there are things we could do. Uh, this evidence can be relevant and can be helpful, but it's not, it's not certain. It's not absolutely uh, accurate every time, and we need to put in place the protections. Um, well, I must say, North Carolina is, uh, in many ways, at the cutting edge. First time. Uh, at the cutting edge of um, uh, criminal justice reform. And uh, it, uh, North Carolina has better criminal discovery um, than any other uh, state in the country. Uh, they have open file discovery, which means that 
If the prosecutor has the evidence, it has to be turned over to the, to the, to the defendant. And that's fair, because think about what happens at the crime scene. The police come in and they mop up everything, as they should. And so the state has a great advantage in gathering evidence, some of it inculpatory, but some of it can be quite exculpatory. And so I think it's an entirely fair thing to do. And North Carolina, after bitter experience with a number of cases, which I think people here know, uh, where there were miscarriages of justice, responded to it by adopting um, uh, uh, procedures um, like, that's, uh, like the ones Tom um, uh, mentioned and open file discovery and, uh, and uh, a number of other reforms that I think are, are really beneficial. Now this is um, really highly commendable because it is not like such experience haven't happened in other states or with federal prosecutions. But the difference is that North Carolina reacted what I think is rationally and uh, commendably, by actually making reforms that, 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 that have made a difference. Um, the response from other places, including, I'm afraid, uh, the, the US government, uh, has been to, uh, to, to resist change. One of the other changes that's been put in effect in North Carolina, which I believe we're still the only state in the nation that has uh, an independent innocence commission. Uh, that is set up specifically to review cases, oftentimes many, many years later, uh, where there's new evidence that could exonerate a defendant. Um, and it's a, it, I'll be honest with you, I was part of the group that set it up, and it was a, it's a very, very hard thing for a case even to get there, much less to actually be overturned. And yet we've had a number of cases uh, in which defendants have been exonerated through the Innocence Commission. So, you know, it's not, it, it, I think it's important when we're talking about this issue for no one to, to immediately say, oh, well, that, those two guys up there are soft on crime uh, because they want reform and they want to do things right. I don't think that's a fair characterization of people who want reform. People who want reform are looking for justice uh, and to be sure the justice system works um, at, its, at its highest level because that's what gives people confidence in the courts. Well, and, and it's, uh, it's what we all want. Uh, no one here wants an innocent person languishing in prison. I mean, this is just not the kind of society we are. That's not how we think of ourselves. And we certainly don't want the guilty guy around the community doing more harm. So this is, uh, this is exactly the right thing. Now, the, 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 the Innocence Commission, I, I did want to say a couple of words about it because that's a very important aspect. As technology changes, we learn more about evidence. Uh, it turns out we can often reconsider uh, cases and set free people who have been wrongfully convicted. But there has been very mixed reactions uh, in, in most places. And, um, resistance to DNA testing. Sometimes uh, legislatures had to actually pass statutes saying if DNA is available, you must test because prosecutors have been so adamant about uh, 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 testing. But I think what is important, there are a number of places in the country where the prosecutors themselves, the DAs themselves, have offices that, uh, innocence units that reconsider cases. The pro and I think those are certainly a step in the right direction. The problem is that they are only as good and as aggressive as the DA himself uh, uh, is, is willing to be. And so, for example, uh, in New York, um, uh, the DA there is very aggressive about it, and a number of cases have come out of there where people have been proven to be uh, innocent. Uh, other places, they have such units, and uh, there's not, you know, they're part of the prosecutorial establishment, and they're less effective. So I think doing uh, what um, uh, Tom helped bring here to North Carolina, having a state commission that is independent of the attorney general or of district attorneys that does not answer to them, I think is a very good idea and ought to be emulated in other states. So again, I want to change our direction a little bit and move to 
some sort of overarching issues that I think exist in our criminal justice system, and I want to begin with race um, and talk a little bit about uh, where you think, Judge, if you would, um, race plays a role uh, in uh, our criminal justice system. At, at what different spots of, of uh, uh, the process? Well, it is, uh, there is, um, you know, it is a fact of who we are as a society that we tend to live in neighborhoods of people that are like us. And like it or not, this is, this is how it is. We live, you know, those of us who are middle class live with other middle class people. Poor people live in other parts of town. And, um, and generally communities tend to uh, stick together. And um, so we, can, we have some indication of, uh, of crime. And crime tends to be in the poor neighborhoods, tends to be violent crime tends to be greater in the poor neighborhoods uh, and in the parts of town that, uh, that um, are occupied by minorities. And that is a important fact that is, you know, too often it is sort of used by one side or another to say uh, it gives a complete answer, but it doesn't. Um, the, uh, I uh, mentioned to you over, over um, uh, when we talked this morning, I had a case um, where I wound up putting somebody in prison for 20 years. Uh, it wasn't my choice. Uh, I gave him the least I could under the law. Uh, but here's how the case arose. This was a case uh, in Los Angeles. It grew out of what we call projects, which means sort of low-income housing. And as it happened, it was everybody in that neighborhood was black. And um, the uh, parents called and complained to the authorities, to the police, that they could not send their children to school without having somebody stop them and try to sell them drugs. So the police, uh, with the help of the federal authorities, with the Drug Enforcement Administration, sent in a bunch of um, uh, uh, undercover agents to try to put a stop to this. And this is entirely understandable. Uh, people are entitled to have police protection. They're entitled to have uh, be a, a safe neighborhood for their children to go to school. Uh, but the result of it is that because the crime tends to be concentrated there, because there is much drug activity, you have to send police in to deal with it. Um, the consequence in, in, in my case is that they happened to find this one guy. He wasn't selling drugs, but um, he knew how to get some, and he was persuaded to provide some drugs. And the next thing we know, he is serving a 20-year sentence. Uh, he goes in, and he was living with his wife and two or three then little children. And... Um, he was doing handiwork, he was doing repair work, he was, uh, you know, he had many occupations, but at least he was there and he was trying to put food on the table and be a father of the children. Uh, as a consequence of this, um, he was taken out of the community and I saw him. I, I had a, I've been a judge long enough to actually send somebody to prison for 20 years and see them come out. And it was a different person. It was a different guy. He was a shadow of himself. I couldn't, uh, I, I had him on supervised release and I, um, uh, that's why he came back. And um, uh, he was a greatly diminished person. I asked him about his family, about his children. Children didn't know him, his wife had left him. Uh, he was uh, basically a shadow of a human being. Uh, we did that to him as a society. Uh, and um, uh, it, uh, it was a very sad thing. But I understand the need for doing that. I understand the need for policing. And my concern, um, as I see the um, uh, cries of violence in the, in the uh, um, uh, minority communities and, uh, and the, the, the sort of reaction against this, I'm afraid the police will withdraw. 
I'm afraid the police will be afraid to go in, uh, not so much, to, uh, I mean, somewhat the fear of getting shot, but also the fear of being prosecuted, or the fear of being reviled. And that ultimately the, the um, uh, victims of that will be the law-abiding people who t have no choice but to live in communities uh, where there's a great deal of crime. I think we need to recognize that it's a complex and difficult problem, and we don't solve the problem by pulling police off the streets and leaving the communities unprotected. So you, you in that answer, you raise, uh, again, I think several questions. One is the influence of uh, race in police practices. Um, and we, we've been through a lot of different approaches uh, in policing in the United States, and, and probably the one that um, has, has tended to make some difference, at least in my experience, was community-based policing, where uh, instead of doing what we did in the old days during the war on drugs, which is place police officers on the corner where we knew drug activity was, wait for drug activity and arrest people, uh, we put police officers uh, out on the street, out in the neighborhood to get to know people, and even if they didn't arrest somebody, their presence ran the drugs away, oftentimes just inside, but at least they weren't out on the street anymore, uh, and, it, and it did result in, in fewer arrests, and I think over time, safer communities. Um, but now we're in a situation uh, where we're, we're having a rash of um, police shootings in the United States. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they're captured on video, uh, which, you know, before cell phones, we didn't have a chance to capture that kind of evidence. We do now. It's heightened our awareness of this. Do you see solutions? Well, I, I am not an expert in policing. Uh, I certainly think there are solutions. I think we must have solutions. Um, uh, I think um, trying to develop a trust uh, between police and the community is important. Uh, but I think it's also important to realize that these are not necessarily interracial issues. They are simply uh, Lots of the police um, are minorities themselves and really uh, only want what the public wants, I and mean, that is a safe environment. And we have to make it possible for them to, in fact, walk those streets uh, or make themselves member of the community without being uh, attacked, without being um, uh, fearing for their lives. Um, uh, I think. Um, you know, technology brings changes, not always for the best. Um, we are seeing things which is good, uh, things are recorded which is good, but they're also given great prominence, or perhaps greater prominence than they deserve, uh, the, and, and, and selective prominence. Um, there may well be uh, a lot of incidents involving, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, other kinds of incidents where uh, nothing bad happens. And those are not recorded, nobody puts them up. And I'm just wondering to what extent these incidents we've had are really typical. Um, uh, when you have a dangerous environment, when you have police having to go in and deal with a dangerous environment, you will have um, occasional violence. Uh, and uh, sometimes there will be mistakes made which are not uh, defensible and not commendable. Uh, certainly better training of police is, is important. Um, better pay of police is important. Um, and um, uh, an effort to bring the police into the community when they're not being called an emergency uh, is important. Uh, the problem is when you get a 911 call when you get a domestic violence call, when you get a call with somebody with a gun, um, uh, police are not going to be polite. I mean, th this is not a time for the police to be, uh, to be gentle and polite. And if that's the only time the community sees the police, that's, I think, a skewed picture. So I do think it's very important to have them be there at times when 
emergencies are not going on. Um, unfortunately, um, that means more police. Uh, if you want them there, just being there when there's no emergency going on, deterring by their presence, you have to provide enough funding to put police in the, uh, on the spot um, uh, you know, so they have a visible presence in a non-emergency situation. So you'll see people wandering around Dean Wagner and Dean Brinkley picking up index cards. It makes me a little suspicious that the current and former dean of the law school are the ones that are picking up the cards. Um, you know, you can't, you can't uh, cross-examine judges in this setting. It's not, it's not appropriate. I just want to make that clear to you. Uh, so we will begin to take some questions in a minute, but I want to ask uh, a little further on the question of, of the influence of race or racial bias. Uh, once, once you get past the policing part and you've got somebody who's now been charged uh, or now been arrested, let's start there, um, are there pressure points in the system where you think we have to pay particular attention to the possibility of racial bias? Well, you mentioned... Um and we say bias, you know, it, 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 bias has sort of a, a uh, negative connotation, like prejudice. And, but I, I think you don't mean it that way. I think you mean bias in the sense that uh, the system is so sort of skewed by its nature. Uh, and so we have to, uh, and you know, one of the realities is, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, eyewitness identifications. I think cross-racial identifications are particularly difficult and often prone to error. Um, it's just the way we are. I mean, we can't change who we are, but it tends to be that we, if we are uh, Caucasians, we see a lot of Asians that all look alike. We see uh, all blacks or many blacks, particularly in an emergency situation, the recollection uh, uh, is in cross-racial um, uh, identifications uh, t tends to be weak. Uh, so I think that needs to be taken into account uh, in, in making charging decisions uh, rather than, uh, and it's a particularly important at that point to have um, uh, lineups uh, or selections that are in, not in any way influenced um, by, by the police. Uh, and um, uh, so you know that's that's one of the ways of untilting the system. Um, you know I think um, uh, making sure that prosecutorial offices reflect the community in terms of uh, uh, racial, gender, um, ethnicity makeup is important. Um, uh, that they bring that point of view that that, uh, that, uh, that the police force is not one race and the community a different race. I think that is important. Again, that takes outreach and takes money and it takes commitment. Um, uh, I think having prosecutors' offices, and I think that may be the most difficult thing of all, um, uh, yeah, I once commented in a case that um, in many ways all of us judges are the same. Uh, you know, there's now been an effort to have, uh, you know, sex, uh, difference in gender, you know, have more female judges and uh, minorities and uh, the, you know, um, diversity of all sorts. But I don't have any colleagues who are poor. I don't have any colleagues who grew up in, uh, I didn't, I mean, I'm not claiming anything for myself, but uh, there are large, ass and that's true of lawyers in general, when I said prosecutor, that's true of lawyers in general. Uh, so um, many prosecutors, and most prosecutors come out of our law schools, and they, you know, they don't look like America, they look like middle class America. Um, and I think it is important for prosecutors in particular, uh, who then often go on to become judges and often defense lawyers, to uh, be like America, to be reflective of the community where they prosecute. Uh, because there are many perspectives that you can bring from having come from that community that will uh, <coughs> 
that will inform the prosecution decisions that you make. Uh, and uh, people can be very much of goodwill and trying to do a good job, but if you don't have the experience, you don't have anybody you can talk to who's had the experience or who's lived in the community, it becomes very difficult to see things from the perspective uh, of the person you think you're charging. So, so I remember when I was engaged in this world much more than I am now, that one of the, one of the things we tried to do, I, I worked with a group in, in New York called the Beer Institute of Justice, um, to try to get them interested in looking at prosecutors' offices and particularly looking at the charging practice. Because there are a lot of people who think that there is, uh, you know, there are differences in the way people are charged, sometimes based on their race. Uh, and we actually got three prosecutors uh, from different large communities around the country to look at that very issue, to open up their offices, allow researchers to come in and watch that charging practice uh, to see if, uh, if it was true that um, it, it, somebody who, was, who, who had some cocaine uh, and was arrested. Uh, if they were white, they sometimes got charged just with possession of cocaine. If they were African American, obviously, uh, often they got charged with possession, possession with intent to sell and deliver, possession with of drug paraphernalia, um, and on and on. Uh, and the, the the number of charges one has when you show up for sentencing matters in terms of the outcome of the case and the, the length of the sentence. And the reason I got interested in that was. Judges are the ones that often get blamed for the differential in sentencing that is, uh, if, you do the, if you do an analysis uh, of lengths of sentences, oftentimes in some jurisdictions, those uh, sentences are longer for African Americans, and judges tended to get the blame for it, and oftentimes it might have been the underlying charging practice. So I think those, all these are areas that we need to do more research. We need to look at more uh, frequently than we have in the past. Now. Um, I'll, I'll let you comment on that, Judge, and then I have uh, enough cards here to make up a deck of 52, I think. Um, and so we got a lot of questions, and I want to turn to those. But you have comments about... Um, well, I, I agree about the charging practices and the significance of that, but it starts even earlier. You saw it when you came to sentencing. Um, the overcharging has its greatest effect at plea bargaining, uh, because if a uh, defendant is charged with multiple crimes and is looking to go into um, trial, uh, he may feel innocent, he may think he's innocent of most of the crimes, he may think he can actually prove that he's innocent, uh, but juries are unpredictable, uh, trials are unpredictable, and uh, the prosecutor will say, well, you know, you take a plea, you can spend four years, and if you don't, you will never see your baby again. You know, you've got children at home, by the time you get out, you'll be an old man, and there'll be adults with children of their own. And that's a, that is a um, um, proposition that many people simply can't accept. Uh, and so they see the litany of charges and they say, look, there's some chance some juror is going to convict me of something and could convict me of everything. In that case, my life is lost. And so overcharging winds up being a huge problem. Now, that one I lay at the, uh, in part at the feet of the legislature. Uh, I assume North Carolina is just like every other legislature in the country and not all the different from Congress, but Congress passes a lot of laws that are quite nebulous and that gives wide discretion to prosecutors um, to charge. And time and time again, the US Supreme Court has come out years later and said, no, this is not a crime, this is not a crime, this is not a crime. You saw it last term with the governor of Virginia, uh, McDonald, right, uh, Governor McDonald, where he was charged, he was tried, he was convicted, not a crime. Well, at least he's the governor of Virginia and he had the fortitude and the, and, the, and the resources to fight back. For everyone like that, there are dozens and scores of people who just can't take the risk and don't have the resources to fight back. Uh, and so legislatures have to be more careful 
in passing criminal laws. Criminal laws ought not to be something that you find out what they mean after you uh, are convicted. There should be clear notice, clear notice for anybody, this is prohibited and this is forbidden. We live in a free society and it can only be free if the line between what is punishable by going to prison and what is lawful is clear to every citizen. If it's not clear, if it's something that has to be made up by a prosecutor, and eventually you don't find out about it until years later when the Supreme Court or uh, the highest court of the state says, no, this is not a crime, that's no bargain, and that's not the way to live. So, so you raise the question of overcharging and its impact on plea bargaining. What about mandatory minimum sentences? Uh, well, I, I'm against mandatory minimums, uh, just as I am against uh, elected judges, just to just say that. Uh, I can say yeah, that. I agree on both counts. Okay, because, uh, you know, life tenure is a wonderful thing. <laughs> um, but um, mandatory minimums, uh, you know, I have had to impose mandatory minimums, and I've spoken out in court, uh, and uh, not just the one case I mentioned, there have been other cases. And um, I haven't always felt that the mandatory minimum was the wrong sentence. I, I, there have been cases where mandatory minimum was 10 years, and I thought I probably would have given about 10 years anyway, because uh, it was pretty bad. Uh, but they only come into effect when, or they only matter when you are in a situation where the judge who is on the scene, who is able to judge the defendant, uh, the crime, the conduct, the remorse, all the circumstances, thinks the punishment ought to be less. So by definition, you have a situation where the judge thinks this is way too much punishment and we're gonna tie the judge's hands. And I think we ought to have more respect for the system or more respect for the judges to have them assess the situation and make a fair and just determination of the punishment rather than having somebody in the abstract who doesn't know the facts of this case who you know is 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 uh, you know the case hasn't happened yet when the law is passed uh, set a set a minimum. Uh, I I've personally never seen a minimum that I thought was uh, necessary, and I've seen many that I thought were unfair. And I think that certainly during the uh, past decades, we've had a number of laws enacted around the country: three strikes, you're out. Those kind of laws that have added. Uh, significantly, as have many mandatory minimums to uh, our problems with incarceration. Um, so one of our questions is, to, for you to address, if you would, uh, the question of both are our courts overburdened, and uh, I can certainly speak to state courts if you want, but um, are, are they overburdened? What is the, the state of public defense uh, in, in the United States? That is, what the do we have enough public defenders? Are they, are they uh, provided adequate resources to really put on a defense? Um, and how do these uh, pressures of overburdened court system and uh, potentially uh, uh, you know, not enough uh, resources put into the public defense system, how does that affect uh, pleas of guilty, incarceration, uh, justice overall? Well, we, we certainly are uh, overburdened in the federal courts. It, it varies to some extent. Uh, some courts are far more overburdened than others. Fortunately, um, in the federal system, we can shuttle judges back and forth, certainly within the circuit, and I used to do that a great deal. The Ninth Circuit is huge, so I was able to, I don't have, didn't have to ask permission from the Chief Justice from Washington to shuttle judges from one state in, in the Ninth Circuit uh, to another, and, and that was a great benefit. Um, uh, um, across the country, you actually have to get approval of the Chief Justice, and, uh, and it's more difficult. Um, but I don't think we are nearly as overburdened as in the federal system as in the state courts. Uh, but I, I assume that the dynamic we see in the federal system is much the same as in the state court. Because you can't try every case, there is a great deal of pressure to, uh, to bargain. 
And um, I think there's um, some pressure on defense law. I mean, of course, public defender's offices are understaffed. And there's some pressure uh, not to take too many cases to trial uh, because it can't be handled by the system. And uh, you, you, you may be viewed as a bad sport or as, as being non-cooperative. Uh, so there's a great pressure because the system simply cannot try anything like the number of cases we have there's a great deal of pressure to, to settle. And so we've had dwindling trials. We had dwindling civil trials, uh, but we've also had a dwindling number of criminal trials. Some cases still go to trial, but for a variety of reasons, understaffing uh, and uh, overcharging being the, the two main ones, we've had fewer and fewer uh, criminal trials. It uh, doesn't mean there have been fewer people going to prison. They do go to prison. It's just not after a trial. From experience in state courts where we've seen, um, I don't know what the percentage is, but it felt like 95 or, or more percent of the cases we dealt with in criminal court were handled by plea bargaining. Um, you know, very few cases actually get tried other than those most serious ones. Um, t talk a little bit, if you would, about the role of the Eighth Amendment Cruel and Unusual Punishment and how it might apply to um, the state of prisons in the United States, uh, their overcrowded nature in many, many states, um, and what your view of, of that uh, is. Well, we, um, uh, first of all, there's a great deal of law from the Supreme Court, uh, so lengthy sentences by and large uh, sell uh, s seldom wind up violating uh, the Eighth Amendment, the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. Um, uh, we had a case involving, I mean, a very extreme case involving a bad check and a third strike, and that was held to be uh, an, um, uh, cruel and unusual, but it's, you have to have an extreme, extreme case. So that uh, avenue is closed, at least under current Supreme Court jurisprudence. Um, the um, Review of our um, 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 prisons, uh, prison litigation, uh, actually is quite a bit more promising. We had a case out of California uh, where there was a charge of overcrowding, and the district court, uh, it was a three judge district court, uh, imposed uh, a monitor uh, who um, then did a report and um, recommended um, that. Um, quite a few, uh, a large percentage of, uh, uh, well, he didn't say release, but essentially the prison population had to be reduced significantly or the number of prisons um, beds had to be increased. It was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court upheld it. It's an opinion by Justice Kennedy, and I recommend reading. Um, and um, that is an avenue of, uh, of approaching. I now don't remember, I read the case when it came out and I've read it since and I now don't remember whether it was an Eighth Amendment theory or some other theory, I, I, I just don't have it in my mind. But um, it is possible to get relief and if in fact prison conditions are so bad that um, uh, um, you know, the amount of cruelty uh, there is an avenue of relief, but there's a long ways between the place where you'd want to be in a civilized society and to have reasonably um, um, reasonable accommodations where prisoners get exercise on a regular basis, where they have space in their cells, where they, 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 um, uh, they, they have humane conditions between that situation and a situation where you actually get a Eighth Amendment violation or, or you know, some basis for the federal courts to intervene. You have to have highly extreme conditions and that all that in between space, um, you might not be able to get relief at all. And yet we should be doing better. So, so as, as we see more and more controversy around um, prisoners in isolation, uh, around women who may, uh, be, be forced to deliver babies in prison, uh, those kinds of situations. Do you see the Eighth Amendment expanding in the future uh, to deal with this kind of 
uh, what many consider to be less than humane treatment of prisoners? Uh, it certainly could. And there are other avenues, due process, uh, sort of a, a due process claim um, uh, is another possibility. Uh, I certainly think that um, solitary confinement is highly ripe for review. Justice Kennedy spoke out on the subject in one of his uh, opinions, not in a majority opinion, but uh, I believe but in a, in a concurrence, and he lamented uh, the prevalence of solitary confinement, mm -hmm. uh, prisoners of solitary confinement. I, th I do believe that is going to be the next um, um, uh, uh, cutting edge of attack. Uh, there are uh, countless prisoners in what they call SHUs. Uh, I forget what it stands for. Uh, but security units uh, in prisons where they're essentially solitary confinement, or sometimes there are two prisoners, but they're not let out, um, uh, maybe one hour of exercise every couple of days. And um, there is evidence that uh, uh, long-term solitary confinement can have um, permanent, cause permanent brain damage, permanent psychosis uh, in prisoners. And um, I do believe this is going to be the next uh, cutting edge uh, of litigation. So uh, <clears throat> we talked earlier about uh, trying to better identif <clears throat> identify who, who were the offenders that were really uh, uh, a risk to our public safety and using incarceration to, to restrain them and to um, Capacitate them so that we were in a better position to, to have a safe society. In some states, and I, I don't know this with, uh, about the federal courts, uh, use um, different kinds of assessments to try to predict um, risk uh, in offenders. Is that something you see um, as being both used but also potentially challenged uh, in the courts? Well, there is a huge amount of power given to prosecutors. What to prosecute for, how hard to bargain, um, and uh, you know what to charge with, and how much to charge with, and how much to um, insist by way of punishment. Um, uh, and I saw a piece recently where it showed that for the same crime, um, uh, one prison, I think it was Kansas, got something like 20 years. If it happened in New York City, it would have been six months. If it had been in, uh, if it'd been in other parts of the country, it would have been a two or three years. Uh, with a, but the difference was not in the substantive law. The difference is, was in the practices of charging and what judges were accepting by way of plea bargains. And um, this guy just committed his crime in the wrong place. If he had, if, uh, if he had just done it somewhere else, uh, he would have still been punished if caught, uh, but the punishment would have been drastically less. And that in itself creates an unfairness. Um, the idea that, uh, that you do the same conduct in one place in the country and you get punished, you get essentially a slap on the wrist or sort of a mild punishment, and if you do it someplace else, depending on who the prosecutor is, even sometimes in different counties of the same state, because different prosecutors have different practices. Uh, so if you do it across the line over there, you might get six months in jail. If you do it over here, you get 10 years in prison. And there's some uh, terrible unfairness about that, uh, to think that, that the accident of who your prosecutor happens to be uh, uh, will, will make that much difference in your life. So, so I have a couple of questions. Yeah, we have one more question. One more question. One more. Okay, well, I have, I just wanted to make, two. yeah, sure. I'm happy to have two. Uh, <laughs> how about 50? How about 50? You know, um, so I do want to point out that we have a couple of questions uh, that are asking the judge to give an opinion about uh, things like the death penalty stop and frisk, uh, issues like that, which potentially 
could uh, and sometimes have come before him, uh, so he may feel less than comfortable stating a position about that. I, I will tell you that on the stop and frisk question, th there's been an awful lot in print uh, of late uh, about that issue, including uh, a, n a number of reports of findings about its effectiveness or really lack of effectiveness uh, and why it was actually given up by police because of its um, ineffectiveness. So uh, I won't ask him to comment uh, on, on those issues yeah, unless he Thank just you. really wants to, but I don't think he will want to I think, I think it's uh, fine. because um, you, you know, I think that would be uh, inappropriate, so we won't ask. Um, let me see if I find one last uh, scintillating question here. Um, well, well let, me just, let me just take this one for you, and, and that is, um, you know, the role of drugs uh, and the role they play in the criminal justice system and the impact they have on, on what's happened to incarceration in this country uh, is, as we all know, extremely significant. Um, talk to us a little bit about how, how you think our society and our court system ought to deal with um, the drugs that we see, both addiction issues but also uh, those that are in it clearly for uh, the money. You know, I am old enough to remember a time before the war on drugs. Um, the war on drugs, I think it was started at the time of President Nixon. I, I know it was back there sometime, but I'm pretty sure it was, uh, it was in the Nixon era. And this was going to be a great boon. We're going to rid America of drugs and uh, by putting all these people in prison, having these harsh sentences. You know, it hasn't worked. Uh, we have more people in prison, but we're not a drug-free society by any means. If anything, the problem has gotten worse. Um, and at the same time, uh, you have um, decriminalization in many countries. Portugal, I believe, the, uh, uh, Holland, I believe, uh, uh, many drugs are legal. And they are worth looking at. They don't seem to have problems that are worse than ours. Um, and uh, I, I'm not at the point of advocating decriminalization, but I do think, uh, as I said when I was in college, you know, one definition of insanity is you keep doing the same thing when it doesn't work. Uh, you just keep doing the same thing and escalating. And what we have been doing is we start the war on drugs. It's now been long enough. It's been 40 years. So we say, you know, we've given the experiment a chance to work. I think it's well worth taking another look and saying, is another way better? Are we now better off than we were 40 years ago now that we've put 2.2 million people in prison? Not all of them for drugs, but a very large percentage uh, of them uh, on account of drugs. Uh, maybe we ought to treat it more as a public health problem than a police problem. Uh, and the drug laws um, skew all manner of things. Police searches, they, they, uh, 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 automobile stops, uh, it just, it, it, it has all sorts of collateral effect on the way our law is developed. Much of our criminal law, much of our uh, criminal procedural law over the last 40 years has been drug law, has been things having to do with something involving drugs. Not all of it, but much more than you would, uh, you would expect. And have we gotten our money's worth? Have we gotten, have, is the effort we're putting into it, is the harm that we are inflicting on people who get caught worth it? Are we getting equal or more out of it in terms of harm avoided to the public? I'm not sure. And I think we need to seriously consider it. Uh, at the same time, it's very hard as a, um, if you are running for office, uh, to come out uh, in favor of, uh, of uh, lowering um, uh, uh, punishments or even decriminalizing drugs. It's, uh, it's a good way to get defeated at the polls. So we are winding to the end, and uh, as we do, I want to tell you that there are some issues that um, I'm sure both of us would love to talk about. 
that we're not going to get to. Uh, and they range from um, the influence on prison unions, uh, of prison unions on incarceration. Um, I could talk about that from my experience in consulting with California, where they have a huge prison union that was against reform uh, for a long time, I think came around uh, eventually. We, we have questions about um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the federalization of crimes. Are, are we now bringing more and more crimes into federal court uh, than uh, we once did? Um, Somebody asked uh, whether we're publicly endorsing a candidate for governor. Um, uh, you know, that, that's the same kind of question about uh, when the judge asked if our legislature was like uh, all the others, and I didn't want to take a vote on that. Um, so uh, we, we have uh, lots of really, really interesting questions. And that means that uh, these are important issues, and this conversation should continue in the classrooms at this university, um, out, out uh, near the old well, and um, among uh, people who can make a difference in uh, creating uh, a land in which uh, we're all equal uh, under the law and that we are a country that believes in justice for all. So thank you for allowing us to be with you. And let's thank Judge Kaczynski.